This is a Rubik's Cube. It has 43 million 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 possible combinations. But how many combinations does a 4D Rubik's Cube have? But before we get to that, we should cover why the normal Rubik's Cube has so many possible combinations. To understand this, let's disassemble the Rubik's Cube first. And by doing that, we can see there's a fixed core in the middle, 12 of these corner pieces, each with three colors on them, and eight of these edge pieces, which have two colors on them. And we can put it in one of two ways in each location, like this, or like this. So two possible orientations, meaning that there are 24 ways in which we can place the first edge. And then for the next edge, there are only 11 possible locations, and we can orient it in one of two ways once again. And this pattern continues, so 9 times 2, 8 times 2, all the way to the very last one, where there's only just one location left and two possible orientations. And now that we put all of the 12 edges in place, now we'll put everything else, so all of the corners. Or in other words, the three colored pieces. And there are three possible orientations, so like this, this, or this. Then the next corner has seven possible positions and three possible orientations. And then the pattern repeats over and over again, like for the edges. Also note how when I turn the cube like this, um, the corners and edges don't interact ever. So I can just multiply both of the group of numbers together like so. Since the order or how we multiply the numbers doesn't matter, we can shuffle the numbers around for the edge combinations like this which can be rewritten as 12 factorial, and 2 multiplied by itself 12 times can be written as 2 to the power of 12. We can apply the same logic for corners, but as you can see, the answer to this isn't 43 quintillion like I mentioned before. That's because there are certain states on the Rubik's Cube that are impossible to reach when turning it normally like this. And to figure that out, we should better understand this most basic turn of the Rubik's Cube, a quarter turn of an outer layer, you can do things like turn like two layers like that, but that's the same as turning an outer layer and rotating it, or a middle layer like this as well, but that's the same as just doing like two outer layer moves and then rotating the cube like this. So if we just focus on what this does, then we can figure out every possible combination and the limitations. So to better understand the limitations of the cube, we can just look and see what happens when we turn one side. So if we do that, we turn the same amount of edges and corners. And if we were to hypothetically solve this just by swapping two pieces at a time, um, we can do that by swapping these two like this, and then these two, and then these two like that. And then you can apply a similar logic to the corners as well. And what you'll notice is that you need to do an odd number of swaps in order to solve both the corners and edges. And then if you were to turn the cube again like this, it will become an even amount. You just have to swap these two, these two, these two, and these two. I think this way it looks a bit more obvious. And the same thing once again, so both of the amount of swaps you need to solve the cube would be odd for corners, odd for edges. And then this is obviously even because both require zero swaps to have it solved. And this applies no matter how you turn the cube. So this would be odd, odd, even, even, odd, odd, even, even, and so on and so on. This means that you'll never have an odd number of swaps for corners and even number of swaps for edges and vice versa. For this reason, we can eliminate half of the total possibilities because when we put the last two corners in, we can't put them in like this because this is an impossible state. And we can apply a similar logic for the flipped edges. So when we get to the last part of putting the edges in, um, this last edge can only be put in one proper orientation. And the same logic applies for the corners as well if you have them twisted like this or like this. Meaning that when you're putting the last corner in, there's only one possible orientation, much like for the edges. And once you factor all of these in, you get the final answer of about 43 million million million, or quintillion. This is comparable to the amount of grains of sand on Earth. But before we get to the 40 cube, we need to cover the Megaminx as well. The Megaminx has 30 edge pieces, or two colored pieces, and 20 corners, or three colored pieces, sorry. So we can apply the same logic to figure out the total number of possibilities without any restrictions. The first edge has 30 possible locations it can go to, and then it can be oriented in one of two ways, and then 29 possible locations with two possible orientations, 28 to 27 to, all the way to the very last one. Same logic applies for the corners, so the first corner has 20 possible locations it can go to with three possible orientations, and, and so on and so on and so on. But then, if we look at what a turn does to a Megaminx, here's where it differs a bit. 
Because for a Megaminx in this case, we have five corners moving and five edges moving with one turn like so. But more importantly, if we think about the amount of swaps we need to do in order to solve the corners and edges, you'll notice that every single basic turn requires an even number of swaps to solve the cube or each piece type and therefore the cube. Since each basic move just requires an even number of swaps for both the corners and edges, it will just be even again when I turn it. And it will never be odd because if you add two even numbers to each other or subtract an even number from an even number, it will still be even the whole time. Which means that we have to divide it by a quarter. And then the way in which you put the last edge or last corner in terms of orientation is similar to how the normal Rubik's Cube works, which gives us our final answer. And this is somewhat close to the amount of ways you can shuffle a deck of cards, which is 52 factorial, uh, or the amount of atoms in the galaxy we live in. And now we can get to the four dimensional Rubik's Cube. Well, to clarify, I'm talking about a cube that has four spatial dimensions. So it's not like the four corners time. Otherwise you just get a normal Rubik's Cube and that's boring. Well, here's the simplest way to explain it. This is a 3D Rubik's Cube, but if we were to portray it in 2D, we can do it like this. So here you can see five out of the six sides, and if we rotate it like this, we can see the sixth side, although it's out of view. And we can do the same thing for a 40 Rubik's Cube by representing it in three dimensions like this. So in this case, you can see seven out of the eight sides, and if we rotate it like this, um, you can see the eighth side. And as you can also see, every sticker is now 3D instead of 2D. Every side looks like a whole cube instead of being like a 2D side. But I can assure you it's very much like a 4D cube, and if you try to do certain turns on it, which look very funny and weird, you can kind of see how alien it is to us. But fortunately, much like doing the middle turns on a normal Rubik's Cube, every single turn on the 4D cube can be reduced to a simple 90 degree outer turn like this. And that's going to be important for later, but first of all, we'll look at the edge pieces, which have three colors instead of two, and there are 32 of them in total. But the weird thing about it, it's not like the corners where you can orient it in just one of three ways, but you can do it in one of six ways, which means that 32 possible locations you can put the edges in, and then six possible orientations, and then it becomes 31 locations with six possible orientations, 30, then six, all the way to the very last one. So similar logic to before. And as for the corners of the normal Rubik's Cube, which have four colors in four dimensions, there are 16 of them. And you can orient them actually in one of 12 ways. So for the first corner piece, if you were to put it in, there'd be 16 possible locations, but with 12 possible orientations, which is kind of crazy to think about. And the pattern continues like how you'd expect it to. And then there's actually a third piece type that doesn't exist on the normal Rubik's Cube. They kind of look like the centers. There's only two possible ways to orient them, even in a four dimensional Rubik's Cube. So it'd be 24 possible locations, two possible orientations, and then 23, then two, 22, then two, and so on. And then boom, you have the total amount of combinations in which you can assemble a four dimensional Rubik's Cube. But of course there are still limitations even in four dimensions. So if you can see like the four dimensional Rubik's Cube turn, it kind of looks like a 3D Rubik's Cube, like kind of turning on an axis like this. You can clearly see like everything that's moving. Eight corners, 12 edges, and four face pieces, since two of them are still fixed in place. But more specifically, there are two groups of three corner swaps that need to be made, three groups of three edge swaps, and one group of three face piece swaps. But more importantly, no matter how you turn the cube, there'll always be an even number of corner swaps needed to solve all of the corners. And for both the face pieces and the edges, there'll always be an odd number or an even number of swaps needed to solve it. This means that the face pieces and the edges will always be either odd odd or even even, and never odd even or even odd, much like the pieces of the normal Rubik's Cube. Also, the corners will always be even, much like the pieces on a Mega Mix. This means that only two out of these eight options are possible or a quarter, so we divide by four once again. And then we get to the last part, which comes down to how we orient the last piece that we put in. So you might remember for the, the edges or the corners, pointing it in like this is impossible. Um, it has to go in solved. But in four dimensions, the final edge can still be put in in one of three possible orientations. So we have to change the last number in the equation. For the corners, 
it can still go in it in one of four different ways. And the face pieces are just like the edges in which there's only one possible orientation at the end. But anyway, with that all accounted for, you get this final answer, which is so big that the amount of atoms in the observable universe is only like 10 to the power of 80. Actually, the only thing I could find that was somewhat comparable was something called Shannon's number, which is a very approximate low band estimate for the amount of possible chess games that can be played, which is 10 to the power of 120. Anyway, that's all. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.